Good morning, good evening. Uh, uh, welcome to a Mirage uh, talk uh, by the Mirage Institute. Today we have uh, Professor uh, Adizes from uh, uh, Santa Barbara, who will talk to us about healthy companies, how and why. The stage is yours. Thank you, Ari. Well, uh, I'm doing this on the request of my one of my best friends of 60 years, Leshek Ettinger and his wife Etty, so I'm glad to comply with the request and to share with you my 50 years of experience uh, consulting to companies all over the world, actually in 52 countries and some of them in the, between, from startups all the way to the largest on, on earth. And uh, the subject is a healthy company, how and why? Why is it such an important subject, at least for me, and uh, opened my eyes? Because uh, as a student of economics and being a professor, you always say, you know, what the purpose of an organization is to produce profits or return on investment, or when Keynes said it in the long run, whatever that means. And then the next question is, uh, how do we produce profits? And we have a lot of theories you know, marketing theory, strategic planning, how you make the profits, etc. One day, I was visiting my mother in Israel and telling her about all my success. I have 28 books in 36 languages, 21 honorary doctorates, you know. And I, was, I wanted to make her so proud of me. And she's listening to me, nodding her head like a good mother. She took my hand in her hand, tapped on my hand and says, yes, my son, yes, my son, but how is your health? All at once I said, wait a moment. All these achievements I could not do if I was not healthy. So how do you produce profits in the short run and in the long run? By being healthy. If the organization is not healthy, it cannot produce the profits. Maybe it can produce in the short run something, you know, like a meteor will appears and disappears. And then I start asking myself the question, what does it mean to be healthy? If you want to have sustainable profits, what does it mean to be healthy? To, look, to make a long story short, because we have only one hour, and by the way, it's a, such a short time, one hour is really, at best it's an intellectual striptease. Uh, but if you look at my website, and I have, I hope you have my full name there, with my spelling, uh, you can find, I have 100 videos on YouTube, and I have 26 books in English, on 36 languages, some of them in Hebrew, so you can learn more. Or if you want to know even more, Adizis Institute has an online program when we teach this methodology. And this methodology has been tested. What I'm going to tell you about organizational health, how to be and why to be, uh, has been tested over 50 years in 52 countries, including Israel. Elbit has been Adizisized. We went from 150 million now to 4 billion. And many other companies including all the countries around the world. So it's been tested and documented. So I'm not telling you something professorial imagined in the windowless room. <clears throat> what is it? What makes it, what, so why healthy? Because for sustainable long-term success, that's why. Whatever success is measured. For a business organization, success will be measured in profits return on investment, return of investment, increase in stockholders, uh, shareholders' value. And for a non-for-profit will be to achieving the non-for-profit goals. And for a country, and I've consulted to eight prime ministers, including Shimon Peres. So a country also has a goal. Whatever the goal is, you better be healthy if you want to achieve the goal sustainably over time. So let's put the why aside. Let's go into the how. <clears throat> what I discovered in 50 years is 
that what, what makes an organization healthy is if it is effective and efficient in the short and the long run. And what does it mean to be effective? To satisfy client needs, whoever the client is. For a country, the client is a people. For a non-for-profit, the client is a purpose of the non-for-profit. For a business organization, ask yourself the question, who will cry if I die? That's my measurement. Who gives a shit? Who needs you? And a differentiate between client, customer, and stakeholders, which in the literature is a big confusion. For me, a client is who makes a decision to buy it, not necessarily who consumes it. Who makes the decision? No, who pays? And the stakeholders are whom do you have to keep relatively happy so they continue giving you the resources you need to satisfy the client needs. So the focus is on the client. Client needs, who makes a decision to pay. And you can measure that. How do you measure it? Look at the restaurant. If the people don't come back to the restaurant, how good is the restaurant? Not very good. So the measurement that I use in my consulting practice is, what is the repeat sales? What percentage of sales are repeat sales? Are they coming back? If they're coming back, you mean that you're satisfying the need in a competitive market. And by the way, this applies not just to the CEO of the company, it applies to any manager in the company. Accounting has clients too. Who is a client? Who needs the information? It's not only the IRS. Other people inside the company need the information. Are you satisfying the, the, the need? And you can ask the clients, if you had a choice, that's why the competitive market is important here. If you had a choice, would you get the service outside or continue using the service on the inside? If they said, if I could only get out, oh my God, that means they're not satisfying the need. Every manager must have a client that he identifies and knows what the needs are and ask themselves the question, will they come back if they had a choice? And that includes marriage. Will your spouse come back if she had a choice? She or he. And if they're stuck, you're not satisfying a need. Same thing for a country. How many people want to get into the country versus how many people want to get out of the country it tells you how healthy the country is. Does it satisfy the needs of its population? And you have to do it efficiently. Because people are willing to pay a price to satisfy a need in a competitive market. And there is a cost to satisfying that need. If the cost of satisfying the need is less than the perceived value of that need, per perceived, no, as measured by how much people are willing to pay, the difference is profit. So profit is not a dirty word. It measures adding value. You're adding value. You're satisfying a need at a less cost than the, co than the value of the need is. But that's good in the short run. Why? Because it needs change. The environment changes. So you need now to be effective in the long run. And what does it mean in the long run? You have to plan. Oops, what is planning? Planning is not what we are going to do tomorrow. That's called dreaming. Planning is what are we going to do today to get ready for tomorrow so when tomorrow arrives, we are ready to satisfy that need. For that, you need to be creative and you have to be willing to take risk. It's called you must be willing to be an entrepreneurial in spirit. So the company has to be entrepreneurial in spirit. Look at the environment, think what is going to change, how do we prepare to take the change, and how do we take the risk to be able to satisfy that need in the future when the future arrives. Not good enough. To be efficient in the long run, we also have to be integrated. Why integration is important? Because when the company is not integrated, when there is a lot of internal fighting, there is a lot of wasted energy. And we know from physics that energy is fixed. So any energy that is being wasted on fighting is not available to fight the market. I had companies 
startup companies where the technology was incredible. Patent, competitive advantage in technology. The market was dying for the product or for the service. And when you have a market and you have a technology, money will come. They will come and knock on your door and they want to give you the money. So they had money, market and technology and went bankrupt. How come? The parties were fighting, that's how come. And when you fight inside, your eyes go inside, they don't look outside. And you miss the opportunity. So you need internal integration, working together. Now let me tell you what internal integration means, which is the source of being healthy. Without integration, the first three roles, satisfying client needs efficiently, proactively, will not work. Why? Because energy is wasted on fighting. So integration is a platform on which everything else happens. It's the essence. What is it? Most important part of my presentation to you today. Most important part. <coughs> Whenever there is change, there are problems. Why? Well, here's why. What is change? Something new is happening out there. New. That's why change. It's new. Now you have to decide what to do about it. And it's like coming to an intersection. And I have to decide, do I go left, do I go right? What the hell do I, what do I do? Some people cannot make a decision. Say, I don't have enough information, too risky. Uh, let's wait. You're not going to make a decision. You just made a decision. You made a decision not to make a decision, to stay where you are. Not to go left, not to go right, not to go back, to stay where you are. And maybe it's a worse decision. Why? Even if you are on the right road, if you don't move, a truck might come and run you over. Why? You're not changing, but the world is continues to change, my friend. The world is not saying, oh, if you don't change, we'll wait for you until you change. It continues changing. A truck will appear and run you over. So you have to decide, and maybe you decide not to change, but consciously, rather than say, I'm not deciding, which is denial. You have to decide. In a, in a situation of uncertainty. Why? Because you don't have all the information until it happens. You only know on Monday morning what happened on Sunday. You don't know on Sunday what's going to happen on Monday. And then there's the problem of implementation. You made a decision. Now when you implement, holy cow. There is risk. That's why when there is change, we say we have a problem. What should we do and how much risk can we take? So the more change, the more problems. So what? Ah. What causes these problems? Everything is a system. A company is a system. Every system is comprised of subsystems. Let's take a company. It has a marketing subsystem, sales subsystem, production subsystem, financial accounting subsystem, information system subsystem, human resources subsystem, many subsystems. What I discovered is that the subsystems do not advance in synchronicity at the same speed. Marketing changes fast. Well, but we need a new product line and how do we advertise it? How do we price it? Okay, it will take some time to make a plan. How long does it take to change the sales effort? Retrain the salesman, retrain the customers. Re oh, takes a little bit longer. huh? How long does it take to change operations and production? Holy cow. That's why all the people in operations say, guys, slow down. God damn it. We cannot catch up. How long does it take to change the accounting system, the information system? You should live long enough. And how long does it take to change the human capital? Attitudes, climate, people. Wow. Now look what that means. Whenever there is change, there are gaps in the system called disintegration manifested in what we call problems. 
all problems, whether you have a problems in personal life, whether you have a problems in your marriage, whether you have a problem in your company, whether you have a problem in a country, hello, Israel, are you hearing me? Comes from disintegration caused by change. So what do we do? Stop change in order not to have problems. And that's what some fanatic religions try to do. Some fanatic Orthodox Jews still live in the Middle Ages. Same thing with their fanatic uh, Muslims, fanatic Christianity. They say, stop change. Does it work? You're anachronistic. It does not work. You don't have a choice. We need to change. You don't have a choice. So we need to learn how to manage change. And how do we do that? It is the bottom line. The bottom line. If everything, all problems, are caused by change, manifested by caused by causing disintegration, what the solution? Real solution, not band-aid solution. Change the product, raise the price, give a discount, do more advertising, uh, fire the president, have another president. These are all band-aids. The real solution, strategic solution, if all problems are caused by disintegration, what is the solution? Integration. Align the subsystems. Subsystems alignment. By the way, go to adizes.com website, you find out testimonials. A company by the name Wonderful that owns Fiji water, 60% of the pistachio market, biggest, mar biggest farm in the United States. They went from $12 million sales to $4 billion sales. And the owner is still 100% owner. Organic growth. Look at the website. It says, thanks to the Adizes methodology. And when you ask him, what is the secret? He says, alignment. Because whenever you change, you start falling apart. The trick is not to fall apart as you change. For all, some of you probably are in fast growing companies. Beware, beware. I'm going to say three times, beware. No company should grow like this. Because if you grow like this, there is only one way, eventually, down. You will fall apart. You will fall apart. The question is only when. The franchisees will sue you, the licensees will sue you, the government will sue you, the clients will sue you. Something will happen. I don't know what, but something will happen. Quality of the product is no good. Something will happen. Look at another testimonial, because some of you are probably in high tech. Applied material. When I started with them, there were 400 million. When I left, it's done, made done, 15 billion. What was the trick? Alignment, 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 alignment. Don't allow this alignment. How do you do that? How do you do that alignment? Ready? In order to manage change, you need to decide and to implement the decision. Here you have uncertainty, here you have risk. In order to make a good decision, you have to take into account the subsystems and to align them. The decision has to align them, right? Now look, big picture first. Then you go to the details, which I cannot because of time. I'm already... You have a subsystem that deals with effectiveness. The subsystem that deals with efficiency. Subsystem that should deal with the long-term effectiveness. Subsystem that should deal with the integration. Short-term effectiveness, who does that? Sales, 
uh, to satisfy present client needs. Production, produce present client needs. Who takes care of efficiency? Accounting, human resources, the right people at the right jobs and the right compensation with the right whatever. Quality control. Who does the long-term effectiveness? Marketing. Looking at the long run. Where are we going? What's happening in the market? What's changing? What should we be doing? Strategic planning. New product development. R&D. Systems design, not help desk. System design in IT. Who does the integration? Excellent question. Most companies have nobody doing that. And they hire some consultant to do OD development. Don't have a short-term solution to a long-term problem. Because that's a long-term problem. Why? Because change is ongoing. You need to have somebody ongoing doing the integration. And that's a business institute if I can give you a commercial. We do that for the companies. Keep it continuously aligned, continuously aligned, so you can grow from 12 million to 4 billion. So what do you need? Diversity. Diversity. A diversified organizational structure. In Adidas, we give a lot of emphasis to structure. For instance, do not have marketing reporting to sales. If I look at a company, I say, VP for sales and marketing. Thank you very much. Done. Sick. Why? Marketing cannot report to sales. Marketing look in long run. Sales look in short run. Sales will suffocate marketing. Then marketing, I call it transvestite. It looks like a woman. Take the skirt off. Ah, it's a man. What happened? They're doing sales support, cold marketing. They're not doing marketing. They cannot because sales dominates it. Don't put, God forbid, engineering under production. It's called engineering, but you know what they're doing? Maintenance. Why? Because they're serving the production. The long term is serving the short run. The long run dies. There's another thing that we insist on which we usually don't succeed. We succeed to split sales from marketing. We succeed to split production from engineering or R&D. God forbid you have it all together. The one that we recommend and we usually rarely succeed because they're very powerful. We cannot, we cannot break them. We cannot break them. Split finance from accounting. Accounting looks from the past to the present. Finance should look present to the future. The finance is creative. Where do we get the money? Where do we invest the money? How do we manage the fin financial engineering, you can call it? Accounting is to be precise and conservative. So if you have the together, who wins? If financial orientation wins, you have very creative accounting, you don't know what the shit is going on. If you have an accountant, CPA, a C controller on the top of finance, you will be liquid like fish. They will not let you use any money because they're conservative. Split. And split human resources development from human resources administration. And human resources development outsource it because it's very difficult to integrate from the inside because you will get a crossfire of the political interest within the company. Structure is very important. Structure is to be good. You cannot have a short five foot two guy playing basketball. The task goes for a tall guy. Diversity. Working together. So if you forget what I'm telling you, remember this symbol. You go to any church. And last week I went to a Baha'i place and I found out, no Baha'i, uh, Bali place, sorry, from Bali. And they have a sculpture, you know, their, their gods stand like this too. India, they all stand like this too. What the hell is this? This is a Hamsa. 
What do you see? Four fingers together. Do you see that? Four different fingers together. What they're telling you, the saints, all, in all religions, be different together. Hello, Israel, do you hear me? Be different together. And in the Middle East, when we curse each other, God forbid, we do like this in the face. What does it tell you? Be different, not together. Now you waste all the energy. And you're dying. In America, is also a problem. We are increasingly going this way. That's why America is on the decline. America is on the decline. We used to be different together. Live and let live. Not anymore. Next question. Why should they be together? And by the way, some political ideologies, religions, say we should be together, but not different. The same. Look at this. The same together. Communism, fascism, and fanatic religions. Inquisition. Present time Muslim, fanatic Muslims. If you are not a Muslim, we behead you. Middle Ages, if you are not Christian, we kick you out of Spain or put you in Inquisition. Communism, fascism. And what happens? Paralysis, that's what happens. Spain got paralyzed from the Middle Ages because they kicked the Jews out. Now they want them back. Because we need diversity. But why should we be together? Okay, be together. Why? Because there should be symbiosis. We benefit from being together. There's a benefit. I'm not just joining it because uh, I'm in love. There's a benefit to joining. There's self-interest. But now watch it. I'm going to contribute to the system, believing that the system is going to give me back. Would you give money to a corrupt government? Would you pay taxes honestly in a corrupt government? Probably not. If they're corrupt, I'll be corrupt too. But if you believe in the system and you benefit education and health and security and whatever, gladly I will pay my share. So, in order to have symbiosis, you need mutual trust. In order to have synergy and growthful diversity, you need mutual respect. I accept your differences. You don't have to be the same. So a healthy system is symbiotic and synergistic. Diversity that works together with mutual trust and respect. If there is no symbiosis, the human body will fall apart. If there is no synergy, it will not be growing. Same thing for a company. Same thing for a country. Same thing for a marriage. All systems. And what makes it synergetic? Symbiotic and synergetic. What makes it synergetic is mutual respect. You don't have to be like me. You don't have to be the same. The kidney does not interfere with the heart, and the heart does not interfere with the lungs, and the lungs don't interfere with the uh, whatever. Who interferes? Cancer. It does not have respect for the other organs. You have to be like me. You can call the cancer being a fascist, you know, or a communist, whatever it is. They want to monopolize the whole body, and in doing so, kill the body. Fanatic exclusivity is cancerous. You want diversity, which is growthful, synergetic, because it has mutual respect of differences. I respect your difference. You don't have to be like me. Live and let live. And for symbiosis, you need mutual trust. Why? I'm contributing to a system I trust. If I don't trust it, why the hell am I doing it? So what is a healthy company, my friends? 
A healthy company is one that has a culture of mutual trust and respect. Thank you very much. I think I finished my lecture. All the rest is commentary. Why did Yugoslavia, where I was born, I'm from Yugoslavia. I cry for that country that disappeared. What a beautiful country. What a beautiful diversity in music, in ethnic, in food. Gone. Why did not Switzerland disappear? Can you imagine French, Italian, and Germans together? I mean, they've been in, at each other's throat every war. What's the difference between Yugoslavia and Switzerland? A culture of mutual trust and respect. Why did that company I told you that had the market, had the technology, had the money go bankrupt? Because it had no mutual trust and respect. Or it didn't have a complementary team. Right now I'm consulting to some startup company in Israel, which I love dearly. They have the technology. Jesus, they have the technology. They have an incredible patent, really incredible. And the market is there. What's the problem? No complementary team. Chief technology officer, genius. Understands business, nada. He cannot raise any money because he is flying there. He talks to them with the technology and the investor looks at him and says, I don't give money to this guy. He's a genius, but I'm, <laughs> I don't trust him to manage my money. What do you need? Diversity, complementary team, complementary team. All the four roles have to be there. Somebody takes care of their short run, somebody of the long run, somebody of the integration, somebody of the long. It is a complementary team. You need a complementary structure composed of a complementary team working together. Diversity that complements each other, like a marriage. Look whom did you marry? I promise you, you married somebody who compliments you. You married somebody, you fell in love with somebody who is strong in what you are weak. That's why they drive you crazy. And what's the problem? You want them to be strong in what you are strong, but they cannot be because what you are strong in, they are weak in. How can they be strong in what you are? Why you are not like me? Because I'm not you. Complementary team, complementary structure, working with mutual trust and respect. That is a secret. What makes a company successful, what makes a country successful is not the resources you have. What made America successful what made America success? Made. It's not resources. Other countries have more. It's not size. Other countries maybe are bigger. What was it? Diversity with mutual trust and respect. And the moment America loses it, it's on its way down. It is on its way down. What destroys a marriage is not when you get divorced. You're thinking about the divorce much earlier than when you find the papers of divorce. When do you start thinking about the divorce? When you don't trust and you don't respect your partner. It's over. The biggest asset a company can have is an asset it cannot sell. Let me repeat it. The biggest asset a company can have, should have, can have, is what it cannot sell. You cannot sell your culture. You can buy, and I offer you that these institute services to do that for you if you're a CEO, because we always work with the CEO. We built a culture of mutual trust and respect. 
How? I'll give you the variables. Diversity based on mutual trust and respect. Mutual trust and respect is a function of do you have common vision and values? If the partners have different vision and different values, there's going to be no mutual trust and respect in a marriage, in a company, in a country. We are different, but we have a common vision and we have common values. America has common values. That's what the, the Constitution is all about. America has a integration through the Constitution, not through individual, not a person that integrates, but a system of values documented in the Constitution. Israel does not have it. We don't have a Constitution. We have the religious people saying one system of values, the, 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 the secular people another system of values. It's okay to have left and right, but have a common vision common mission, common values. I, let, I hope I have a lot of Israelis listening to me here. I cannot watch Israeli news. I have the channel at my home in Santa Barbara. Every night I want to watch it. I, I go crazy. You know why? Anytime they have a deun, a discussion, I, I get crazy. They're shouting at each other. Nobody is listening. They're all interrupting each other and calling each other by name, including the Knesset. My God, the Knesset, how they call each other. There is no mutual respect. There's no mutual trust. Nada. This is not going to work. This is what the problem is. It's not going to work. Cannot work. Same thing with a marriage. Same thing with your own personal career. How much self-respect and trust do you have? It's called self-esteem. If you don't trust yourself, if you don't respect well, you know, your own decisions, how the hell are you going to build a career? So you need common vision and values, one. Two, you need a diversified, correctly diversified organizational structure. Correctly diversified organizational structure. I only gave you a little tip here and there. It's much more complicated than that. It's like architecture. It takes me three years to train people in the Disney Institute to be certified to do organizational architecture. Three years. Do it right. You're not just building a Shikuna Mamipo. You're trying to build the Taj Mahal. Next. A disciplined decision-making process. How to run goddamn meetings. What is the agenda? How correct not the agenda? How do you correctly run a meeting? So that you avoid management by committee. Because you can have a diversified structure, diversified styles of people, but when they get together, you get a management by committee and it becomes a mess. Why? Because they are different, there is going to be conflict. And the conflict can become destructive. They interrupt each other, they get upset with each other, the voices get up, <coughs> and that creates distrust and disrespect, and we are going south. So we have a whole, for instance, I'm sorry I'm doing this marketing, but how otherwise I tell you, so it's not just theory. We have a course online or in person. How to run meetings correctly, how to run diversity to come to conclusions together and agree on a decision and feel good about it. So we capitalize on diversity. We don't reject diversity. We create a synergetic environment <laughs> when we learn from each other by exchanging views and learning from each other. There is a whole methodology how you run a meeting correctly. So you need common vision and values, diversified structure, diversified team, managing meetings in a disciplined way based on mutual trust and respect. If you don't take the course, okay, I'll tell you what the bottom line is. Forbid anything in your company that causes disrespect and mistrust. 
And anything that encourages respect and trust, reward. That's it. You got the course. So you can recreate the will if you want. Or come and learn the will. We'll give you the will. Not good enough. So you have a vision values, structure, decision making process, and what else do you need? The right people. And what is the right people? Is not what you know, is what you are. I was very impressed. There was an interview with uh, with Musk, Elon Musk, and asking what the biggest mistakes you did. He said, I paid too much attention to people's competences, not enough about their personality and attitude. Bravo, Elon, you got it. What people know becomes obsolete over time. You can buy knowledge, guys. Only money. Personality, you cannot buy. Pay attention to what kind of a people are they? What does it mean? Do they command and grant respect and trust? Like in the Israeli Air Force, would you fly with them in your lahaka? Would you fly with them? Will you, will you trust him to fly with you? Would you turn your back to them? Do you work with people you trust? And you respect. What does it mean? They know how to disagree without being disagreeable. Like a good wife. What is a good wife? A valiant wife in the Israeli, in the Jewish religion. Ezer Keneged. How can she be Ezer Keneged? How can she be helpful if she's against? By being against. Telling you where the holes in your argument. Respectfully. If it's not done respectfully, if you have a... If you have a spouse who pushes with a finger in your chest, you're doing it wrong, you never do it right, you don't know what you're doing, why didn't you do this? The hell with you. Is not helpful. You want somebody that does it lovingly, respectfully, exchanging. It has to be mutual. I learn from you, you learn from me. It's a personality. Make decisions with faith rather than from fear. So if you have the right people in the right structure, with a common vision values, making decisions with a disciplined way that nourishes mutual trust and respect. You have a healthy organization, bravo. You were sustainably successful. That has to be established. It does not happen by itself. Nothing good happens by itself, by the way. The bad things happen by themselves. Why? Because change is destructive by nature, you remember? It disintegrates. You don't have to do anything. Just do nothing. <laughs> a friend of mine, his wife asked for a divorce. And he came to me, you know, upset. He says, I don't know why she wants a divorce. I did not do anything. I said, schmuck, that's why she wants a divorce. Because you didn't do anything. You cannot rely on the chupa to be in love forever. Change happens and things start getting separated. You have to bring them back again. You have to bring them back again. You have to bring them back again. It's work. You have to give it attention. And what do you pay attention to? What undermines trust and what undermines respect? Not only with your spouse, with the children. Grow children that have respect and trust, which unfortunately we are losing with the goddamn games and with the television, with all the, you know, we're losing the kids. They're losing the kids. They're losing respect for their parents because they know more than the parents how to manage a TV and how to manage a telephone. I, 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 I'm like an idiot. I say, uh, Sean, what should I do? How do I do that? 
I'm the idiot and he's a genius now. My kid is a genius and I'm an idiot. And the whole thing is upside down now. Here is a formula of success. Formula of success and then you have 15 minutes for questions. Success is a function of denominator, nominator, external integration, denominator, internal disintegration. Again, success of any system, marriage, person, company, country, is a function of external integration divided by internal disintegration. Let me explain. What is external integration? You know it. Strategic planning, marketing. And what is strategic planning and marketing? If you summarize all the books on strategic planning and marketing, and summarize the summary of the summary of the summary of the summary to get to the kernel of what is it all about, it's really integration. What are the opportunities in the market? What are the capabilities of the company? How do you bring them together? You need to. That's what strategic planning is all about. That's what marketing is about. What are we capable? What are the needs? And how do we match them? With the right product, with the right channel, with the right promotion, with the right support, with the right service, with the right uha muha buha to bring together. External integration. For a country, it's called the balance of payments. How much we are exporting versus how much we are importing and our economic strength versus the world market, uha muha buha. Same thing. Personal life is called career planning. What am I good at? What does the market want? And how do I match my capabilities to what the market wants? External integration. Internal disintegration is how much energy is being wasted on fights, on rumors, on backstabbing, on misunderstanding, on miscommunication, misalignment, wasted energy which comes from lack of mutual trust and respect. Now, why does this formula predict success? Because we know from physics that energy is fixed at any point in time. What I found out is that fixed energy, first of all, goes to allocate it to deal with internal disintegration. It's a priority, naturally. And only the surplus left, if any left, goes for external integration. That's why the company told you that startup went bankrupt. Because all the energy went to internal disintegration. They missed the market on the external integration. A this methodology for helping companies grow from 12 million to 4 billion is to minimize internal disintegration common vision values, the right organization structure, the right decision-making process, the right people, it reduces internal disintegration, the energy gets freed for external integration, and Kadima Poel. That is the whole secret. I just gave you the whole secret. Here it is. It explains personal success. You want people that are calmed down. They don't talk too much. Clear eyes. Peace here. Self-respect and trust. They're not afraid of people disagreeing with them. They're not afraid to disagree. Self-confidence, self-esteem. Show me a marriage, same thing. A family, same thing. Show me a company, same thing. Show me a country. I told you, I work with eight prime ministers. That's what I'm doing. And it did not succeed all the time. These companies we have, I don't want to be arrogant, 90% success, but we really have 100% if they are committed. These countries, more difficult. Those politicians have a different reasons why they're in politics. So it's a little bit more difficult, much more difficult. But the principles are the same. The theory is the same. The protocols are the same. 
adapted to a company while they're on the life cycle. You know, it's like medicine. So you decide you want 100 milligrams or 50 milligrams or 5 milligrams. You, we adapt the medicine to the company. So it's custom made. It's not the same treatment all. But the principles are the same. 